Okay, folks, let's go ahead and get started. My name is John Lohman. I am the publisher of the Corridor Business Journal. I want to welcome everybody to our Corridor Rising 2.0 uh, webinar series that we've been doing for the last several weeks. The purpose of these webinars is to help business owners and uh, readers navigate this COVID-19 crisis that is impacting so many of us and so many of our lives. And so we have put together some great um, webinars over the last several weeks, and we've got a great one for you today. And one of the challenges, of course, with this COVID-19 crisis is, is unfortunately a lot of people are getting laid off um, and or salaries reduced or furloughed. And this is really taking a toll on people. And I don't think that toll has been really understood and people are really getting um, a better understanding of all of that's impacting employees, their family members, uh, employers. And so we put together um, a panel today of experts to help us understand what's going on and what can we do to help our employees and our readers and other folks uh, who are going through a challenging time of employment. And so we have put together, we've got two uh, experts uh, with us today. We've got Dr. Kim Bechica and Dr. Selena Pierman, who uh, are gonna share with us their expertise on um, workforce and dealing with grief. Kim uh, Bechica, of course, is the Vice President of Continuing Education and training services at Kirkwood Community College. Basically, in my opinion, Kim is the expert on continuing education, training, and workforce in the corridor. If anybody's got a handle on those um, areas, it's Kim Bechica. So we're fortunate to have Kim with us today. And uh, we're also fortunate to have Dr. Uh, Selena Pierman uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Pierman serves as an organizational psychologist with over 25 years of experience from frontline to senior level positions in a wide range of industries and organizations. While she does uh, some uh, traveling outside of the corridor, Selena is focused primarily on helping Iowa first, making sure we are well prepared to recruit and keep the best people and companies right here in Eastern Iowa. Selena's passion is for help for how people behave and work and how organizations drive results with, um, and with and through their people. And Selena, of course, is also a small business owner with a team that helps support this work with companies and many of those companies are right here in the corridor. So we are fortunate to uh, get started. Um, and I think we're gonna start with Kim. Kim, can you just give us a, an overview of what things are looking like <laughs> with regards to unemployment in the corridor? And what else are you seeing with uh, some of the companies that you're dealing with uh, typically on a, on a daily and weekly basis? Right, you bet. Absolutely, John. And a thank you too to you and our friends at the CBJ for these webinars and all that you do in helping educate and bring opportunities to people in the corridor. So certainly um, we're in unprecedented times. This pandemic has really impacted all of us um, at many different levels and in many different ways, but particularly in our work worlds. Um, we know that the bonds we have with our colleagues are strong, they're important to us. And as this um, COVID-19 has brought a period of budget cuts, changing work patterns, working from home, layoffs and furloughs, we know this is an overwhelming and stressful time for all of us. So today we're really fortunate to have Selena join us as she talks about grief in the workplace. And there's so many different perspectives to that. But in particular, we know that um, this crisis has certainly um, impacted many through layoff but it, all, it also impacts those remaining as they see their friends and coworkers um, going through the very difficult experience of layoff. We also know that the recovery from this recession is gonna look much different than the recovery from 2008 for our employers, uh, businesses, uh, higher education institutions, 
um, it, it will have an impact on us. No one really knows what this is going to look like. Um, from the research that I have done, there's uh, most projections say it might be uh, one or two years, but it really depends on what this virus does on into the future, of course. Um, but we're pretty much guaranteed we're going to be moving into a new normal. And part of that new normal is also going to involve how we deal with grief, how we can deal with anxiety and, uh, and the necessity of being flexible into the future. This particular situation, though, unique, I think, to this recession is the callback phase. Um, COVID, we do hope, is a temporary situation, which means employers who are experiencing layoff absolutely hope they are going to be able to call their employees back and hence while they're filing for layoff as temporary. So also Selena will help with how then what are tools, resources, and communication mechanisms that we can use to stay in touch with individuals and support individuals through layoff and helping them, um, giving them as much information as possible so they can potentially plan as well. Now, I thought you might be interested in some unemployment information that's impacting the state um, and particularly our region. It is really mind boggling. So in Iowa, up till March 14th, we were averaging as a state about 3,000 initial claims um, per month. Um, since that time, we have averaged 41,000, uh, the following week after March 14th, 58,000, 64,000 to this last week ending April 13th of 46,000. That means we, ha we have had over 200,000, 200,009 claims submitted for layoff due to the COVID situation. And if we look back at the 2008 recession, there's a significant difference from what we experienced even in 2008. And we're projecting to end at about 15% unemployment, which is vastly different from the 3.2 that we were at just a month or two ago. Specifically for our region though, that was all for the state. Um, over the past three weeks, I have not been able to get last week's figures yet. We've had 28,000 people file for unemployment in the ICR Iowa region. The two weeks prior to the escalation of these layoffs in our region, we had 579 claims submitted. So again, we are definitely seeing the impact in our region. The industry sectors largely impacted in our region are healthcare and social assistance, manufacturing, retail trade, food service, and construction all at varying levels, but the largest numbers appear to be in healthcare, social insistence, retail trade, and food service. And as we know, that brings also a unique picture because the uh, stimulus bill has certainly done a lot to support and change policies of unemployment, which now are providing additional funds to the unemployed and allowing sole proprietors and different classifications into the system that weren't normally approved. But that also brings a challenge. That's why we don't know how this recession is gonna work because we have certain occupations now in unemployment that are making higher wages than they were while employed. So how will that impact us? What can employers be doing to work with um, and entice that sector um, back in? Because we do have um, employers that are still hiring. So before I turn it over to Selena, I just wanted to leave you with some resources. As I said, we have employers that are hiring and that need individuals. So the ICR Career Collective uh, website, if you go to icriowa.org, uh, will give you that information. It will also inform you if you'd like to get involved and post your positions um, on that site, you can do so. Also at Kirkwood, um, we are assisting those in layoff. So if you go to our website, kirkwood.edu backslash laid off, you, we are working remotely as well, but you will be able to provide us with some information so we can get back in touch with you to help, with you, to help you with jobs, job search or training and education should you be ready for that. 
Um, and finally, at Kirkwood, um, <clears throat> which is a nice segue from this Lunch and Learn, we'll be offering a workplace resilience in unprecedented times four-part series starting on April 22nd. And if you go out to our corporate training website, corporate training at kirkwood.edu, you can find information on that. I'm very impressed with the lineup that we've put together uh, with that to provide community support as well. So again, uh, Kirkwood is here for you, as is the CBJ, to assist in any way that we can. Um, <clears throat> and now I will turn it over to Selena. Hey, Kim, can I just jump in for a second? I, I want to see if you can expand on a couple things before we go to Selena, because uh, you've done a nice job of kind of laying the groundwork of what's happening in our, in our region. I wonder, have you thought about this the Paytech protection program that's uh, helping a lot of small businesses uh, at least for the next eight weeks survive. Do you see unemployment going through kind of a boomerang effect where uh, they're going to ramp back up again so they can get that money forgiven, but then potentially after the eight weeks, there may be um, some more layoffs again as that money um, runs out? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, as we know, the first stimulus amount is about out for the whole nation. So we really don't know yet for our region and for Iowa how many employers will be getting that first check. We know a lot applied, so that's still an unknown. It's certain those who receive it certainly does bolster. Most need, have to call back anyone they've laid off to maximize that benefit. And in eight weeks from now, um, hopefully we will begin opening up, back up. And, and I think the feds hope that that timing coincides. If that timing doesn't coincide, um, I would not be surprised that will the fourth stimulus package is being worked on. So I would not be surprised if in the fourth stimulus package, you might see either the same PPP offered with additional money or even some changes to the PPP as a result of where the state currently is in opening back up. So Kim, That's one, Kim Betchika's crystal ball, right? Okay, great. <laughs> one, one other question, Kim, before we, we switch over to Selena. And, and the question is with regards to some of those employees that are unemployed now, they're actually, they might be making more money being unemployed because the federal government has added some additional incentives uh, for those folks. And so how do you see that playing out over the next uh, X number of months? And, and is that program where there's an additional $600 per, either per week or per month, I'm not sure what it was, uh, is that just a six month program or do you know how long that's gonna, gonna run? I am not sure on the number of weeks that that's going to run. I know there's been an extension, but I would hate to say what that is. Um, but Iowa Workforce Development would be where I would call to find that out. And we do believe that that may have impact on the decision-making process of individuals as to when they want to return to the workforce. At Kirkwood Community College, our hope would be that as individuals are experiencing this layoff, they think about while they're laid off the opportunities they have to invest in their training, education, and skill building because we know in the future, advanced skills are still gonna be needed to be competitive in the employment market. This provides time for individuals to get additional skills. That's not gonna change. The skills employers are looking for after this new normal starts, and I've done a lot of reading on this, isn't going to change. Critical thinking, problem solving, advanced communication skills, high levels of technology skills are still going to be required into the future. So I just, I really encourage individuals or family members or employers who have individuals laid off to think through how they might be able to support them to continue to learn also during this time. Great. Well, thank you for that really foundational uh, understanding of where things are in the corridor and across the, the state of Iowa. And so we're going we're gonna to transition now and dive really into the topic at hand and really what's going on with workplace grief. And so, again, we've got uh, Dr. Selena Perman 
with us uh, today. And Selena, can you talk a little bit more about, or can you talk about your work with organizations and how it connects to our discussion today about grief in the workplace? Sure, thank you. Uh, building on, on what Kim has said, we just, you know, I, I've spent my last years really looking and learning and, and walking alongside companies and of, of looking at this role of work in our lives, right? So when we spend 30, 35, 40% of our adult life at work, this is a pretty significant impact. And from a, from a business standpoint right now, right, we're running a tough equation between keeping the business going and taking care of people and doing that simultaneously. So my particular look has been at usually from a training perspective in partnership with Kirkwood Corporate Training to look at how do we take care of people during this and how do we make sure that we're making good business decisions so it's sustainable over time. Well, when work's got such a huge role in our life and it's just been completely shifted on us, right? Changes in routine, uh, choices we make. And I am particularly interested in how we had, we had hurts and communication issues and team challenges before this hit. And even just now, um, spending time with my clients and, and talking to business owners and talking to frontline employees and what does this look like now? There's a loss, right? So when we think about grief, it's a loss. It's some sort of sadness or distress because there's a bond there. And you wouldn't be grieving something, you wouldn't feel a loss if you didn't care about it. So we've got employees with all different kinds of losses right now, loss of income, loss of coworker, loss of routine, uh, just even the loss of driving to work, right? And, and, and just the changes that have happened. So my interest, my work in partnership with Kirkwood and, and, and all of our companies around is just really looking at how this now shifts when there's not a precedence, we don't have anything to compare to, and it would just be so much easier. I, 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 we talk, you know, I hear this all, it would just be so much easier if we just knew how long this would last, right? Just be so much easier if we just knew. And so what does this state of unknown look like when our work life, which is a chunk of our adult life, is now completely shifted on us? And, and to that last point of, so when we look at that loss, right, we're almost working this in tandem right now. We have a whole set of stuff that goes with employees still working and what that looks like and what that feels like and that strain from our frontline healthcare professionals to our um, retail grocery to our first responders, right? There's so many people working on location and the difference between on location versus remote and then we have this whole set of stuff going on with people who aren't working right now and an entirely different kind of loss or grief process. So those are some of the topics that we're thinking about, we're talking about with folks. Um, I know Kim, as, as she's talking to companies of just how do we balance this equation of making good business decisions so that we have good companies staying right here and yet how do we understand this loss? And this is different than it's ever been before. And what does that yes. mean? So Selena, I, I got a question for you with sure. regards to that. So can you give us some perspective? You've been doing this for 25 years or more. And is there a something similar in those 25 years, maybe 9-11, or if it's been the, the financial crisis of 2008 or the floods of 2008, is there something that... Um, is the equivalent of what we're going through right now from a, from a grief standpoint? My opinion on that would be there isn't a good parallel. I think we can draw some things, right? For, and, and, and it, so a 9-11, a, a flood, right? All of those markers that all of us can probably pull out in our own lives, right? Where there was a significant shift. Um, one of the ways that we look at it is that whatever that was that you remember, right? There's that memory that goes with it. This probably is amplified way more. And because of that uncertainty and a little bit different, this is simultaneously happening to everybody, right? And so, you know, we have this, this cumulative effort going on of everybody experiencing it, but yet those experiences are so personal and so individual. 
because while we're all experiencing this together, what I go through is different than what you're going through. And what you're going through is different than, you know, than, than what your coworker is going through because it's such an individual experience. Um, and yet collectively, right? You can't, all that stuff that's coming at us of all of us going through this together. Yes, thank you. Okay, another question for you, Selena. You know, what are some of the key people challenges in this COVID-19 workplace and how people are working through what has been quite a roller coaster of, of unknowns? Yeah. Uh, some patterns that I'm seeing from companies right now, if there was strain before COVID, there's probably strain going on now. If there were communication gaps going on before, they might be even more amplified. And so we have some risk around there might have been some hurts or some legacies or some memories or some hard changes in the past, which means we've got to make some choices now. Within our teams, that leadership component becomes that much more important to say, hey, folks, while we've had some challenges in the past, how can we take this experience and, and make it even better or learn from it or move forward with it? So, you know, we, we might have had you know, even, even listening in on, on Tuesday, right? We've got companies who were getting ready for a really strong quarter. They started 2020 going, yes. And just even what that, you know, so we might've been riding that pretty well first quarter and then, oh, that all of a sudden something just completely shifted. So those people challenges of communication, of changed roles and responsibilities, of gaps or broken communication flow, even just some past hurts, right? Where we just didn't do well before and now something is even different. Those are the things where I believe either companies and teams have to say, you know, that, that was a divide and we're gonna come through this stronger or if we're not paying attention to it, it actually grows a bigger rift. And I think those are some of the things we've gotta pay attention to in this roller coaster. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about the divide between an owner and a, or a manager and the employees. And, you know, I was talking to a, a business owner just recently and he'd never had to lay off anybody in 25 years. And he's afraid that he's going to have to lay somebody off now with this. And, you know, I think there's an emotional toll on those business owners and those business managers for making these decisions and it's really tough on them, um, but it's of course it's tough on the employee as well. And so, how do you how do you counsel those business owners on dealing with grief themselves? And then, how can they best communicate with their employees about being uh, about the bad situation that those uh, employees are going through as well? That's a great question, John. And I know myself as well, conversations with owners daily, multiple times a day of thinking about, okay, A, how do you make good business decisions so you can sustain through this? And, and yet that, that feeling of, I haven't had to do this before. I always take care of my people or even just some of that pressure of, no, we're going we're gonna to make sure we're taking care of people right now, even at great risk to the viability or the future of the organization. So I always, whether as an owner or a business leader or other employees within an organization, first, we know the techniques of just naming it. And right now there's a whole bunch of crazy emotions going on, right? So I feel, ha you know, I feel confused. I'm um, uncertain, you know, for business owners, there's a whole complex set of feelings there. I'm hopeful, but I feel bad but I want the best and, and just that nerve, you know, that nervousness of, but now we can reposition the business a little bit differently, but I don't want to look like I'm taking advantage of this, but we don't get a reset button very often to shift our business model, you know, so being able to do what's good for the business. But what we also know is that people part, those relationships are critical. So for leaders right now, we need you leading. We need you unaware of when do you show up with your game face on and you're positive and you're looking forward and you're taking good care of your people. And when are those moments you need to show up and, and show a little bit more of that vulnerability to say, I hear you, we're struggling. I got, you know, we're, we're in this together and we'll figure it out together. Probably the number one thing I'm hearing from employees right now is there is no game plan for this and there's no 
there's no group sitting around with all the answers. So when information isn't coming out, employees are still thinking, well, they're not telling us anything. And there's, there's got to be a match. There's someone in the middle. We need to be communicating more. And what I'm hearing leaders struggle with is they just don't know what to communicate because it continues to shape hour by hour, day by day. And reaching out to people who are either on site or off site changes. Our, our communication flow has changed too. So leaders, we got to own it. I think we've got to continue to recognize we've got a range of emotions going on too. And we're trying to make the best decisions in the moment based on the information we have. And we've got to communicate that even more. And for all of us as employees, we've got to understand that there's no playbook for this and that nobody is sitting around with insight, but we need everybody's area of expertise. We need everybody's perspective because they're going to see the business. They're going to see the customer, the supply chain, all of that differently from, from what they know. So talk a little bit about the, either the technology or just some, some basic steps that you would recommend uh, business owners take with their employees, particularly those employees that are all working remotely. And so is it, a, is it a weekly Zoom call? Is it a personal phone calls? I mean, what are some of those steps that these small business owners can do when they're not meeting with folks in person to help with this process? My recommendations are multiple in multiple ways. So, and to keep that schedule or structure. So even pre-COVID, when managers start canceling meetings or they keep moving meetings, there's an, a degree of uncertainty there, but we've got some other things we hold on to now, it's even more important. So if we have a meeting schedule, stick to the meeting schedule and mix it up. It might be um, uh, a personal phone call, it might be a follow-up email, it might be a regular meeting structure. Pre-COVID, we'd map out meetings. What's the purpose of that meeting? How often do we need to meet? What's that look like? Now we need to do an updated communication flow. How does information flow through? How do we manage good meetings? And, and at what point do we touch base? So as business leaders and owners, I want you to know and have a daily pulse on how your employees are today and how you, can you reach out? And that's got a cascade the bigger the organization, the more ways we have that cascaded through the organization that someone's touch and base and keeping that relationship good. Because in a time where there will be openings, right, we want to keep good people with our company and that's going to come back to the relationship and being a really good employer right now, a leader who's reaching out multiple ways, multiple times. So to your examples, all of those and to do it with some regularity so that people aren't left wondering, well, I haven't heard anyone in three days. I don't know, maybe things are okay. Yeah, so Lena, that, that I, regular. Go ahead and add in, Kim, please. So I, ha I have a question. So is it is it those same tactics and strategies that will work for the business owner to stay in touch with those individuals that the situation did call for layoffs? in terms of this being temporary, uh, what are suggestions, tools, and resources that employers, business owners, and employees, who's maybe some team members that have been laid off, can utilize to support first and maintain the connection and transparency of information? Yeah, so to that, because we wanna bring people back, because we wanna come out of this stronger, um, it is maintaining that relationship. So those points of contact, how often will we reach out? Who's reaching out? Being really organized with that. And then as much information as you can share. Pre-COVID, I would have said, we need transparency, but we need to bring people along in that conversation. They have to be ready to know what to do with that information. Now we've got so much different kinds of information out there that we're having a hard time sorting through what's true. So as an employer, we wanna be able to provide consistent streams of information and let our employees know how to receive it. And employees to coworkers, right? There you've got a great opportunity. We've never been as well leveraged with connections and technology than we've been for this crisis to be able to have people reaching out to others so that people who are laid off feel that connection to come back to work there for the people we wanna bring back and help us capture and grow after this crisis has moved on to what's next. So Selena, I think 
you know, can you give us an example? I would imagine an example of somebody that didn't do a good job of after they laid somebody off and they really wanted to bring them back in the future, but they just didn't give them any communication at all. Can you give us an example of, of somebody who really did it right and kind of what are some of the steps that they did to uh, keep those employees or former employees engaged so they can bring them back when, when things improved? Sure. An example would be that if we've taken good care of the relationship up until that decision point to, to say, we need to make this decision to lay you off, then I'm going to leverage every ounce of that relationship now during this next period. And so um, being able to clearly communicate it and provide updates and stay in touch with them, whether that is phone calls, whether that's a, a note uh, or something mailed out. The difficulty is where I see it is if we've not been good at building that relationship or I've not been a leader where I've taken good care of that relationship, that's going to become that much more important now. And at first, the, the, the human response is, okay, why are they being so nice to me now? They just laid me off, right? Or why are they reaching out and trying to share more information with me? And we as employees also need to go, huh, pause. They're trying. They're, they're communicating with me. Okay, what can I learn from this? I, so we've got to do some repair. So if leaders have not been taking good care of that relationship, there's no time like the present to try and rebuild it. And even a little bit of humility and vulnerability to say, hey, we want this we want to be able to come out of this stronger. You're an important piece of that. So really think about it as an internal communications plan or marketing plan to your own employees. Why does your business need those employees to help us come out of this stronger? So everything we do with customers out there, we're now bringing in to build this relationship in genuine, transparent ways in-house. So Selena, I probably should have asked this question earlier uh, in your, your remarks, but can you talk just a little bit about grief in general and what that looks like and how do you know somebody's grieving or not grieving? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, an emotional, of course, issue, but is, is there some telltale signs that somebody's really grieving right now? Are you able to help us get a better handle on that? So one of the ways... I look at it as, as we think about some of the research behind it as changes in patterns. So if my employee, my team member has been consistently who I know them to be and something has shifted, right? So there's a different pattern of behavior. There's just something that has changed differently than it was before. There's, there's our first set of signals. Uh, people have different levels of disclosure. Some people are gonna go, ah, I'm fine. And some people, this is hitting a lot harder and they're gonna to wanna to talk about it. So even just making observations of paying attention to whether it's virtually and what you're seeing people on video calls and are they like, like how they've been or just that check-in of how are you doing and really pausing, not the Iowa, hey, how you doing and move on, but the how are you today? Because today, given our current situation could be very different than it was yesterday. And this afternoon could be different than this morning. And we see that range of, of emotions coming out. Not everybody's going to display them the same way, right? We knew that before this, and that'll continue on later, but people are going to show that differently. So overreactions. I, I, I'm seeing things like that we wouldn't have normal, and now we just get at this overreaction to something that was something really simple. Interestingly, I would also say in the last couple of weeks, I have seen... Uh, a move to more micromanagement and the fact that visibility has changed. So if I'm off site, I can't check firsthand. I can't walk by and pick up on those signals I would have normally seen. So now in, in some power or, and I don't mean power in a bad way, but now I'm, I'm micromanaging even more because I'm waiting for a response and I haven't heard from you and my computer's on. And, you know, so just watching for some of those reactions that may be more exaggerated or maybe more subdued where you've got someone who communicates pretty regularly and now they're just quieter and being able to say, hey, how you doing? What can I do to help? What are you running into that we didn't plan for? We didn't, haven't addressed yet what what's our next step so yeah lots of ups and downs right now and 
um, people are processing at all different kinds of in all different kinds of ways. You know, one of the one of my friends uh, who runs a business in the in the region, you know, he he's a very upbeat perf person, and he frames some questions that I. I should have been thinking about, but I wasn't thinking about. It's like, you know, what are you learning right now in this? How, how is your business evolving? How are you pivoting so you can come out of this better? And so, you know, can you talk? I mean, I think those are some great questions that can be asked to not only business owners, but employees. Um, so, you know, what advice would you give a, a business owner, a business manager on strategies to, to come out of this even stronger uh, than than before the uh, the COVID um, pandemic. I believe it's even stronger right now to have put those tough topics on the table. Was there an area of our business that has shifted that we just we weren't talking about the true stuff? We weren't talking about losses there. We weren't talking about business changes or customer segments moving around. And so really being able to put the tough topics on the table and really take that look at the business to say, okay, how do we reposition this so, as you said, to come out of this stronger? So looking at your data, looking at your numbers, but then getting people's perspective of um, where they see the future of that or what possibilities have we just not even looked at because they weren't there before. And now we've got, as you said, pivot differently because we have an opportunity and none of us would have asked for a reset button like this, but how do we leverage this opportunity to make it even better to whatever that new normal is? So taking a hard look at what do we know, um, scanning your environment to really look up and down your um, supply chain, your process out to customers, to really think about what is this evolved to and where might those opportunities be that you can now step into that when you wouldn't even considered it six or eight weeks ago that has now presented itself. Those are some pretty hard pivots, but people can be a huge part of that. Our best idea sources are the people closest to those processes. What could we be doing now that we, we couldn't do before because we just didn't have the, the capacity or the ability or, or, or that opportunity? So Selena, I assume if, if so we had some small business owners watching this today and, and they need some expertise and some help, uh, getting a hold of you um, would certainly be an option for them during this process as well. Happy, happy just to be a resource. So find me always through Kirkwood Corporate Training. Uh, in a funny, not so funny, I'm now laughing moment, a couple of weeks before COVID hit, my website was hacked. Uh, it, I, I won't speak to what kind of site it became. I'm now laughing a little harder about it. Uh, so thankfully, I've reclaimed my name and it's now down, but I'm out there on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, but you can always find me through Kirkwood and uh, Kim's team at Corporate Training. Well, anything else, Selena, that you want to share with the, the group before we start to, to wrap it up? I think it's just, a, you know, this is a hard, unprecedented time, and I want people to access resources, be able to um, find good information, check in with people, and really use this as a, you know, I've been using the phrase space and grace, right? So we're giving each other a little bit of space that we don't have any experience with this, but we're also that, just that compassion of knowing we're all learning together, and that's a, that's a pretty powerful moment that I think we've just got a great opportunity to do. So thanks for the invitation to share some ideas with you. Yeah, thank you. Kim, is there anything else? I mean, obviously you mentioned a few things that Kirkwood has is, is really been a, a, an amazing partner for so many businesses and organizations and, and industries across the corridor. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with, uh, with our listeners today and uh, the resources that Kirkwood has? Yeah, you know, the one thing I'd add on to Selena is don't forget about the networks you've developed over time. What I personally have found so helpful through this time is reaching out to my colleagues in the state and nationally to say, how are you doing? What are you doing? What are you focusing on? Um, because this is new for everybody. So we also want to learn from what others are doing to help build our plans as well. Um, and it's also a time I've seen where people are willing to share 
and to help everybody out during that time. So yes, John, as you know, Kirkwood Community College is here for the community. Uh, we, re we are busy at work determining uh, recovery and our new normal and additional community resources and services that we hope to be able to provide as we can begin um, getting back uh, either through social distancing, face-to-face um, uh, -face on campus and opening up some classrooms and so forth as to what we can bring to the community. So that's really exciting for us as well as we hope that the community will want to get involved. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Kim, and thank you, Selena, for your time today and your expertise and helping all of these uh, business owners and industries get through this challenging time. And so thank you so much. Uh, I did want to make mention a couple of up, upcoming things happening at the CBJ for uh, the, the information of our, our readers and our listeners. Uh, basically, all of our events for April, May, and June have either gone virtual or have been pushed to a later date in, in, the, in the fall or later. Our normally scheduled Innovation Watch event uh, scheduled for May 12th is happening, but it is going to be a virtual event. And this event explores some of the latest advances in technology in the corridor. And we uh, are really excited. There's going to be a sub-theme this year with how innovation in Iowa is helping combat the COVID-19 crisis. And so I think there's going to be some great stories in there that people are going to be interested in hearing about. Our fastest growing companies event has been moved to August and the applications deadlines for that has been extended to May 15th. And then uh, we just announced uh, recently earlier in the week that uh, our keynote speaker for our mid-year economic review event scheduled for June 24th will be Charlie Evans, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. That event will also be a virtual event and uh, we'll also have a panel of business leaders moderated by Jack Evans. And so that's one of our uh, premier events coming up on June 24th. You can register uh, for all of those events on our website at corridorbusiness.com. Uh, I did wanna mention our, cup, our next two webinars uh, coming up, um, we have one on fraud for small businesses. We've got uh, experts from the Better Business Bureau and the Iowa Insurance Division. That's coming up next Tuesday at 12 noon. And then on Thursday, April 23rd, we will have one on how nonprofits are pivoting during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, again, all of those uh, webinars are free and you can register for them through our website at quarterbusiness.com. And then finally, I have been asked by lots of folks how they can help the Quarter Business Journal during this challenging time. And uh, all attendees from this webinar will be getting an email from me. Uh, and I would encourage you to subscribe to the digital version of the Quarter Business Journal. That is really the best way. If you're not a subscriber of the CBJ, that's really the best way to help us continue to do the things that we're doing to keep uh, our audience and our readers informed. And so, um, and then lastly, if anybody's interested in sponsoring these webinars, we are doing these uh, for the next several weeks. And so uh, reach out to me if you have any interest in that. So thanks again to Kim, thanks again to Selena. Uh, stay healthy and keep reading uh, the Corridor Business Journal. Thank you so much.